Hi, and welcome to the next session of Powerbox Secure at Home. I'm Rick Kuahara, COO and Chief Compliance Officer of Powerbox, and I'm happy to welcome uh, with us here our sponsors and our assessing company, um, Beyond LLC. Uh, we have Kathleen Nye and Ray Biondo. Um, before I hand it over to them for the session uh, to get the presentation started, I uh, just wanted to um, also mention a little housekeeping. If you have any questions that you want to ask, go ahead and throw it in that session Q&A um, right next to the, to the screen there on Whova, and we'll save it for the end and answer any questions then. Um, if for some reason we can't get to a question, then we'll do some written responses and we'll be emailing that out to everybody after the presentation, uh, after the conference is over. But let me go ahead and share the screen and get these slides up and I'll pass it over to um, Catherine and Ray. Excellent, thank you, Rick. Good afternoon or good morning. My name is Kathleen Nye. I am the CEO of Beyond LLC. We are a high trust assessor organization. We are located in Chicago, New York, and Orlando, Florida, but we also have consultants all across the United States. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Beyond real quick. And then I'm going to hand it over to Ray Biondo, who's our CIO, to start the discussion that we're going to have. So beyond what we are, we're a high trust assessor organization, but what we do is bring together knowledge and our experience, and we hook it together with the methodologies to streamline and accelerate the um, certification process. So we are an excellent, excellent um, group to help discuss with you preparing for information security compliance and what it entails, the pitfalls that you might have, and also successes and how to get to where you need to be. So to get us going, I'm going to introduce Ray Biondo, Beyond CIO. Ray? Thank you, Kathleen. Hi, everybody. Again, my name is Ray Biondo, and I am the Chief Information Officer at uh, Beyond LLC. My, my primary role here is really to run or manage or uh, build on their information security professional services uh, uh, services. So it's, uh, it's it really, I don't really get into the high trust uh, certification process or doing audits per se, but I do uh, do a lot of risk assessments and also recommendations and also uh, uh, help build out security programs as we, as we as deem necessary as you go through this whole security, uh, preparing for your security compliance. I'm formerly with a uh, healthcare service corporation based out of Chicago, and it was uh, the Blue Cross Blue Shield system with five states. I was the CISO there for 11, 12 years, and I was also on the executive board of the High Trust for several years. So uh, with that, uh, why don't we go to the next slide. Okay, so you know why is why is strong information security programs? Kind of talking to uh, you know an audience like you probably have fairly good or great security programs, but still it is really a question out there because there are so many companies that are so far behind the curve that you really are not aware of it until you're actually in the in the business that we're in at the end. So it it is uh, it is a uh, a challenge for organizations, and it is it's it's a uh, you know, international challenge because hackers don't care where you are, where you live, where you're doing business. It's uh, it's definitely something that uh, in the healthcare sector, which I was in, you know, and all the vendors that we dealt with, we had a uh, we had a challenge. Our, our biggest challenge was how do we find our weakest link, and how do we get that weak, weakest link to improve their information security program. And one of the things we did was we approached our vendors individually. And when I say we, it was many other healthcare payers and providers that uh, joined in to help uh, get the program started. We basically made it uh, almost a mandatory thing to get a high trust certification if you're gonna do business with, with any of our organizations. But what we discovered when we started going out and doing our research was that uh, you know, it's, it is really important to build a level of confidence with your customers. Uh, and the reason why I say that is I was uh, I was involved heavily with the Anthem, and during that, uh, especially post breach, 
I had to go out to all of our customers, all our large customers around the country, and really give them a, uh, you know, a, a reassurance that, hey, listen, we have our act together. We've identified where we have some potential weak links. We've addressed those. And, uh, and, and when, I, when I was done with my road tour, I think we made a, really a lot of good progress. And we all did. It wasn't just me. It's all the CISOs around the healthcare sector that we were involved in. So it's uh, one of the things that uh, you want to make sure is that your customers really understand and have a really understand your program, really have a sense of confidence. And that if you're going to be working with them, especially handling any data, you're not only going to give them the confidence that you can protect it, but you're also going to give them confidence that if they're doing business with you with little to no risk. And the thing is, any information security program, I don't care how small of a company you are, how large of a company you are, is very complex, it's costly, and it's challenging. And the organizations that go through the process uh, really will attest to the fact that, oh, wow, I didn't think when we started that, uh, first of all, that we had any issues. We thought our security program was cast me out. We were the best. But after we did a little digging and they and, and they were they, they joined in helping us with us doing that discovery. We find out that they, well maybe they're not as good as they need to be, but with a little extra effort we could get them up to that level. Next uh, slide, please. So there are one of the one of the things you really need to do before you move forward is to decide you know what's what's going to be your framework. What are you going to look at? Uh, and we've, we've highlighted three of them here. High Trust, obviously, it's the Health Information Trust Alliance. Probably the, it's probably the de facto uh, uh, certification you need to have if you're going to do business in the healthcare sector. And that's a risk management framework. But it also, we have uh, you have NIST, and NIST framework is a great framework, as is ISO. And the beauty of it is that High Trust really incorporates both those frameworks into their into the High Trust uh, Common Security Framework. So it, it, we look at high trust as being probably the best risk, uh, risk-based, risk-based framework that you can use, whether you're in healthcare or, or not. I mean, even if you're a manufacturing company, you don't necessarily have to go to ISO, and you might have clients that require you to do so. But high trust has, I believe, 45 or 44 uh, uh, different. Uh, Frameworks built into it, different regulations built, authoritative sources, I should say, that are built into the program. And those authoritative, authoritative sources are NIST, ISO, PCI, GDPR, uh, and many others that are, are, you know, you have in New York and Texas, NYCC, California, and Texas have their own uh, regulatory bodies that require you to meet those requirements, and that's all built into the high trust framework. Uh, next slide, please, and I think I pass that off to you, Kathleen. Oh, you do. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. So what we're going to talk about here now is the beyond approach to preparing for going through such assessments to kind of, as the title says, take the fear out of going through this process. And so even though it's focused more on preparing for high trust, you can say still use this model to um, take your organization through any type of assessment or certification that you're preparing to go through. So what Beyond does is that with this model, we're, we work one-to-one -one with our clients. We take the information, we take the certification requirements that our um, requirements that our clients scope for, and we formalize a program to take them through the different phases to reach high trust certification. And so what we have found going through this model, we have a 100% success rate and we're very proud of it, but we work very hard with our clients. So as Ray pointed out, one thing you need to do when you're preparing to go through any type of this preparation is to find the right partner that has the knowledge to work with your organization and to get it to where it needs to be. So in front of you, the first side, it's a four phase approach. The first side is phase one, which is a readiness assessment. A readiness assessment is a gap assessment, a risk assessment. We call it the beyond readiness assessment for high trust when it's focused on high trust, or we can do the same to focus on HIPAA or NIST or ISO as well. 
And so going through this readiness assessment, what it does is give you knowledge. It gives you knowledge to know what you don't have in place. So as we, when we work with our clients going through phase one, we want them to be honest as all honest. There's no bad answers. If you're not doing it, this is the time to tell us you're not doing this because then we can formulate an approach, a game plan, a timeline to help get you to the success, to the finish line, to the certification that you're looking to, to achieve. And so within phase one, some of the pitfalls that we find are clients look at their organization, I think Ray, you pointed this out, through rose-colored glasses. They see their organizations as amazing, which they probably are, but when you're going through these types of certifications and preparing for them, you got to peel back the onion, as they say. You got to, you got to, um, um, you got to look at all the information that you have and also all the information that you don't have that's in place. So, and you got to be true to yourself. You got to also, as we pointed out, work with a partner that you have a good relationship with, that you have a good rapport with, but also has your best interests in mind. Um, another aspect, a pitfall when starting these type of assessments is ensuring that you're using the scoring mechanism, score your assessment to how it's going to be scored when you actually go through the certification. So just don't use one through 10 if you're going through high trust, you wanna use that rubric or use if you're gonna go through NIST, use that scoring mechanism and so on and so forth. So you wanna make sure that as you're going through it, you're going to be looking at it as you're going through the actual validation. And then finally, within phase one, the main thing that we wanna make sure to um, embrace and it's a main pitfall is identifying the scope of the assessment. You wanna make sure you understand the scope that's gonna be looked at. You wanna make sure of what's not being looked at and to include what's being looked at and to get everybody's buy-in. So as you're going on this journey in preparations, you don't have what's called scope creep where things start creeping in or creeping out. You wanna make sure of where you are and what you're looking at. If you can go to the next slide, that'd be great. So phase two is built on phase one. When you have your readiness assessment, you get your information, you know what gaps you need to identify. You take this information and now you're in phase two to prepare for it, to get rid of these gaps, to address what's going on, to put the programs in place, to put the documentation in place, to put um, you know, the tools in place that you need in order to meet the certification that you're striving for. So from phase one, as we got Tony Robbins saying, knowledge is potential, action is power. Phase two is where you put that action in place to get everything in order. So what pitfalls we see to help alleviate any fears through phase two is usually there's a lack of funding during this phase. Everybody, once again, has big ideals, big potential, big things that they wanna do, but they might not have the budget to do it. So that needs to be a main factor when going through this type of process is to make sure and time everything for what your budget allows. The second pitfall during this time or during any of the time is resources, both internal and external. Internal resources, you gotta remember, your team has a day job. They have things that they're doing on a regular basis. And so now they're being asked to do additional work to um, get rid of these gaps. So you wanna be respectful for your resources and also for funding. And then another pitfall during this time is a lack of commitment. Organizations, especially um, the senior level leadership, doesn't always realize the amount of work that goes into um, preparing your organization to meet these certifications. And so we find that when they don't have this understanding of the amount of funding, time, or commitment, that also is a pitfall that can be a failure within um, going through this process. So you want to communicate and you want to put as much up front so there's an understanding and knowledge of what's going on, and then that will lead to most success. Can you go to the next slide, please? 
So once you get phase two in order and you get everything addressed, you got your documentation in place, which is a policies from the senior leadership, the procedure guides, which tell how you're gonna be doing the operations. They're circulated to the proper people. You have your tools in place. You have your um, processes operating as intended. Now you're actually gonna go through the assessment, the validation, whether it's for high trust, or just a HIPAA assessment or NIST or ISO, whatever your, your certification that you're going for. But now you're ready because you know what you needed to address from phase one. Phase two, you got that all in order. And so now you're ready to go through phase three where you know you're gonna be successful because you, were, you addressed everything that needed to be addressed. And so even though it's hard work going through the actual validations because this is where you now have interviews involved with your SMEs, you're now collecting artifacts and samples, and you have usually on-site visits, but of course, during this day and age, on-sites are kind of being held off, um, but they will be back, hopefully. And so you have a lot of work within a short period of time. However, if you have everything set up, and you have it all in order, and you address the gaps in the past, you're going to be successful during this phase. So some of the pitfalls that we identified during phase three that we try to alleviate as we work into it is once again, lack of knowledge in the organization. Right now, you are going through three phases of um, you know, um, getting to your certification. And these three phases can take anywhere from three months, six months to a year to a year and a half. We've had some clients that have taken a couple of years to get ready for their certification. So you got to remember that's a long time and it's a long time and it weighs on people. And so you want to make sure that they have the information, but you also want to make sure that they're ready and willing and able to go through this process. We find when going through um, um, these phases and also going through the assessment, you need to have a point person within an organization that is in charge of going through this certification. Without that point person or team, you will not be successful. You need to have that person that can work with the SMEs on the client side. You need to have that person that can help schedule the calls. You need to have a person that is the company's go-to high trust person that they can rely on. And then that, that go-to person then relies on the assessor organization or the, um, you know, the, your partner that you select. And then finally, another pitfall that we see during this time is the lack of availability of the stakeholders, a lack of availability of the SMEs to participate in the actual validation. So when we begin these validations, we make it very clear on when we're starting and when we're finishing. So they know that there's a start and a stop time for these assessments. So also we put together the interview schedule so people know when they need to be available, what information they need to get for us, and that we're not, during that whole period of time, they're not gonna have to be on. We, we handle expectations so people understand what is going on, what, they're, um, what they need to participate in, and what they don't need to participate in so it doesn't get too out of control. Rick, can you go to the next slide? So with phase three, you get your certification, and then with all good, good certifications, you have to demonstrate that you continually are operating your organization as you're stating to obtain that certification, to maintain that certification. So with high trust, they have on the off year an interim assessment, which demonstrates that um, through testing, through additional testing on a smaller scale, that your documentation is still in place, that you're still operating as you reported to high trust, that you've had no breaches put into place or, or no, no breaches put into place, but no breaches took place during your course of these, um, your operations, but that things are operating and you can maintain your certification. And so if you're successful in one and two and you're successful in three with getting the certification, you will be successful with four as long as you keep things current and um, processing within your organization. So right, with that being said, you can go to the next one, Rick. With that being said, that's just some, um, our methodology of going through an assessment. 
to try to alleviate some of these fears in preparing for these assessments and actually going through the process. And so, Ray, if you have anything else you want to add, we can take any questions that people might have at this point. Yeah, sure. I, ju I just want to get back to that, actually, to the very first slide. And, and I know we talked a lot about high trust here, but in, in reality, this, this is a really common, uh, commonly used approach to uh, uh, getting your information security program up to where it needs to be, the level it needs to be, to get through any kind of uh, uh, assessment or audit whether it's uh, a SOC audit or a, or a PCI or, or your ISO or, or any of those, uh, this is a very good methodology to use. We've been very successful. Obviously, our focus is on high trust. But if you, want to live, if you don't want to scream like that person on the, on the first slide, <laughs> uh, using a very, a, a very phased-in approach very, you know, and, and, and taking a, a logical steps to reach your ultimate goal, uh, I think you'll, you'll, you'll find it a lot more pleasurable, I guess. The, uh, the that last but not least, you're going to need executive leadership uh, support and uh, throughout the whole process from beginning to end and also financing. So it, it, it is a, uh, it's important. I think, I, I think we have, as, and all the assessors at High Trust uh, have played a huge role uh, in our in, in information security and bringing a lot of companies who five, six, seven years ago, would never even give this a second thought, bringing their information security programs up to where some of the, now there's some of the best information security programs yeah. that, are, that are out there. So it, we, we've, we've actually played a huge role in doing that. We're proud of that. And we're here to uh, hopefully do more and help more people going forward. Any questions? You know, we did have one question that um, did kind of go along with, with what you were talking about, Ray and um, Kathleen. It goes back to phase two. And the question was, um, what are some common hidden budget costs that happen in phase two? Sure. I, I will be happy to address that. And, and <laughs> Kathleen, you can correct me if I'm wrong. But the very number one thing that we've seen, and, there's, and it isn't the only thing, but one of the biggest one that we've seen has been documentation, policies and procedure documentation. And I don't care how small or how large you are as an organization, almost every time we get engaged, that is one thing that most organizations have to spend time and dollars on uh, getting their documentation up to snuff. To add what Ray was saying, also um, there's a hidden cost is um, lack of um, commitment. So what I mean by lack of commitment, that this doesn't happen overnight, uh, putting an information security program in place. And so once again, it goes back to that knowledge, peeling back the onion, that type of thing. But when there is, when it goes on and on and on, of course, money needs to go on and on and on and on. And so one way to alleviate that is to work with your partner when you identify all the gaps, when you identify all the gaps, you then identify all the processes that need to be built, whether you know it's the business continuity disaster recovery plan, whether it's um, you know incident response, IT vendor management, and then from there you make the decisions. And if your team can build these processes within your organization using internal resources, even though there's a cost to that, you're still using your internal resources. And if not, you balance out. Okay, we need to get this done. We need to have it done. We need to bring in a team to do it. Like for example, Ray's team um, builds information security programs like this. And then you gotta allocate the cost for that. And that can be done upfront. So you know what to expect and you have um, you know, the programs done. And so there's a way to get rid of these hidden costs if, if you go through this process to identify everything that's wrong identify what the cost would be to put everything in place. Even if it's across a timeline, you can get that documented by, um, you know, an upstanding organization. So you know what you're going to be spending and when it's going to be spent to work with you on that. And then you can get things done, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And uh, so that, that gap assessment, readiness assessment is key. If anything, uh, today, if you go away understanding what that's going to prepare you for, uh, we'll be very happy because that is really going to uh, uncover any potential weaknesses. And, and we even give information back, feedback uh, to our clients 
that uh, we'll even uh, you know try to explain what the what that lift is going to be. Is this going to be a big lift? Uh, you know, not such a big deal. Can you do it with internal resources? Should you go to an MSSP? Should you hire somebody? We will make recommendations. We will debate it with you, our clients, and and then decisions can be made on how to move forward and then have a much better grasp on what those those costs will be. You know, do you think that maybe it also kind of has to do with um, people under budgeting what a good uh, information security program should be in the first place? Because like you said, a lot of people yeah. said they think they're okay, but when they actually start the assessment, they're not. Um, yep. So maybe it's also they're under utilizing their budgets um, and not setting it yep. up in the right way. And I, and I can attest to that because being a CISO for so many years, you know, it's uh, it really is sad, but a lot of times, even in uh, you know large organizations, your CISOs have to go to to war with their competitors, and their competitors are the CIO, the CTO, the the, chief, the CAO, and all the other Cs, and you're competing for a set amount of money. And uh, you know, as much as information security will bubble to the top after a breach, it also goes away when the breach goes away, so to speak. And then, uh, and then other things come to play because the companies still have to develop systems. They still have to maintain systems. They, they have to be competitive. So and that, that costs an enormous amount of money as well. But if you ha- so your job as a leader, in, in, whether you're a CISO or director or manager or whatever, but you're in security, is to be a partner and to, uh, and to be engaged at every step and every phase of every project, every initiative, as long as, uh, as, as, long as you could add value. Something to add to what Ray was saying, um, and one aspect that um, we tend to forget, and this is going back to phase one, going through that readiness assessment to know what needs to be fixed or what gaps are within your organization. When you're building an information security program, you think, okay, it's just information security we need to worry about and nothing else. It's amazing how the information security program goes across company lines, company departments, that it brings in HR, it brings in law, it brings in compliance, it brings in sales, it brings in basically everybody within the organization is included in these assessments in one way or another. And so once again, that can overstretch resources, overstretch budget. It's getting that knowledge to understand what needs to be handled and what needs to be fixed in order to then appropriately prepare and to have the resources and funds to do so. And great. You know, we only got a, a couple minutes left, but I'd be remiss not to just quickly ask, um, how has you know COVID and the pandemic affected assessments and preparing for assessments? Or has it at all? Well, I'll start and then Ray. Um, it kind of hasn't because I'll be, Rick, I'll be honest with you. A lot of stuff has been happening remotely to begin with. And it's amazing how these organizations have been nimble to just turn on and be able to work from, you know, um, remote offices, remote locations. And our, you know, companies that we work with are, they've been able to just do the same. The only thing, like with High Trust, the only thing that has changed is not being able to go on site, which is a big change because going through these assessments, the one-on-one type of um, um, communication adds a lot of knowledge, adds a lot of understanding to the actual assessment that they're going through. But other than that, you know, you pick up the online discussions such as this, the Zoom calls, everybody on Zoom all the time now. And so that helps alleviate what the face-to-face brought about. Ray, do you have anything to add? Yeah, COVID does, did present challenges and, but uh, but honestly, not as, uh as bad as I thought it would be, because we, we are we are, we are a society that works remotely very well. Uh, companies that weren't doing it are have learned real quickly how to do that, obviously. Mm-hmm. But still, face to face adds a lot of value. Sometimes you can get a lot more done a lot quicker being in the office and meeting with all those subject matter experts. I'm mm-hmm. a big proponent, obviously, of of working in an office because I'm a kind of an old school kind of guy. But you know what? It's it's very effective doing it uh, virtually as well. I mean, so I, I, I've learned some lessons doing it this way as well. well perfect. 
you know, thanks so much, both uh, Kathleen and Ray for joining us and again, being a sponsor for the conference here. If you have any questions that you weren't able to ask um, in the session, um, feel free to stop by their sponsor booth um, in the uh, app and you can ask them there. You can also, you know, take a look at the email there, grab a screenshot and uh, shoot them an email if you have any questions. Um, they've been great to work with. You know, we, like we said, they're our assessor partner and um, made the whole high trust journey um, and reassessment very um, easy to go through. Uh, so thank you, Ray. Thank you, Kathleen, again, for being here. You're welcome. Thanks, Rick. Thank you, Rick.